Connected's Membership and Engagement Manager. So we'll be bringing those all together towards the end of the session. Regarding the format of today's webinar, we've an excellent speaker um, who, who's joined us um, in, in, in terms of Hannah Richards, Richens, um, and we're also awaiting another one who's hoping to join us as well. So we're going to see it's a slightly evolving picture as we let people in, but we will have two potentially two speakers, and we also have a fantastic panel, all of whom are going to be bringing their experiences of different ways of opening up access to libraries, either through technology or work by working in partnership with others. Um, there's been some discussion when we were setting up this webinar around what we actually meant by open access and, and put simply, open access technologies allow library members access to their library during set hours when staff aren't present. Libraries Connected recognises that open access isn't a substitute for a staffed library, but it can be a good way to expand provision, extend opening hours and make libraries more accessible outside core staffed opening hours. I believe the first open access library opened in Denmark in 2004, and they are becoming increasingly common across the British Isles. Yet, despite being a relatively established concept, I think it's fair to say open access libraries still come freighted with a degree of uncertainty and maybe debate around those for those authorities who are considering their introduction. They certainly can extend provision beyond the staffed hours, making the library more accessible, but there's all those questions around how that service balance offer balances against the absence of staff and also around the security of the stock to buildings and library users, which is where we bring our speakers into play um, because they'll be bringing their case studies and the best practice on how the technology and innovations have been working for them, alongside some practical hints and tips on the key things to consider when, for others when looking to introduce similar technology. Our first speaker, like I say, will be Hannah Richards, Richins. Hannah's a chartered librarian and head of service at the London Borough of Barnet. She trained as a children's librarian, working first for the schools and public library service in Northamptonshire before moving to Barnet in 2000. Hannah will be speaking today about Barnet's experience of delivering open libraries. After Hannah, um, we, I hope we'll have a second speaker, but if not, we'll move on to our panel and I will introduce them once, once we've heard from Hannah. Like I said, please do put any questions you've got in the chat as they arise and myself and Helen will be collating those and bringing them together. And I believe I can see Jackie. I think Jackie has arrived. Wonderful. Jackie Taylor-Smith. Is that you, your hand, hand up there? Jolly good. Um, I'll introduce Jackie, who's going to be our second speaker as well. Um, Jackie has worked in library sector for nearly 34 years, doing a variety of roles across Kent, starting with a front of house role, then becoming an operational manager, area manager, program and project manager, and now in her current role as one of three senior managers in the service. And Jack will be speaking to us about library extra and co-location in Kent. Okay, those are our speakers introduced. I will now hand the floor to Hannah, and please do put any questions that you have in the comments section. Thank you. Right, I shall attempt to share my screen now, so hopefully uh, nothing will go wrong from this point. So, fingers crossed. You should hopefully have the presentation appearing any moment. Please shout at me um, if you don't and if it doesn't move on. So, um, as Ed said, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of a whistle-stop tour of open access libraries from the perspective of the Barnet experience. Um, and first of all, I need to start off by giving you a little bit of context, because there were some very specific circumstances in which we went down uh, this particular road. So, I have to take you back to 2014, and at the time, uh, Barnet was facing quite a challenging financial uh, situation. And as a library service, we were tasked with trying to find £2.85 million pounds worth of savings from what was then an operating budget of £4.5 million. It was made very, very clear to us from the outset that we could not consider closure. At the time, we had a network of 14 branches, a school library service and a home and mobile library service, all of which were then uh, delivered by the local authority. We had an establishment of 114 full-time equivalent posts and we were open across the network for 634.5 opening hours per week. So we really started looking at open access as a part of a raft of measures to try and make that £2.85 million pounds worth of savings without closing anywhere. Now, we never did make that, um, that level of saving, but we did make £2.2 .2 million pounds worth of savings, of which about £1 million was attributable directly to open access. 
And in Barnet, we call that self-service opening or SSO for short. So we installed the Bibliotheca Open Plus system. Um, so for those of you who don't know how it works, basically it automates the opening and closing of your buildings. So at the beginning of the day, it will turn your lights on and your alarms off. And at the end of the day, it will do the reverse. Um, to all intents and purposes, during your opening hours, your front door is locked and people gain access to the library by scanning their card into a card reader, which is located outside of the front door. And hopefully what you can see on the screen is a picture of the card reader um, for the um, Open Plus version 2. The system comes with a uh, recorded CCTV, um, but our elected members uh, decided quite early on that they wanted us to look at a live monitored um, solution. So we... piggybacked on our corporate CCTV base cameras. And I have to say, as a little bit of an aside, I think one of the really positive things that's come out of all of this is that we now have a much closer relationship with our community safety colleagues, not least because we know uh, one another better, but because we're also physically located within the same control room. We were in quite a privileged position because we were able to pilot the system for 18 months at Edgware Library, which is a mid-sized um, library, before we rolled it out to a further nine libraries across the borough. We now have, um, well, and since 2017, we've had Open Plus running at 10 libraries in the borough. The four that don't run Open Plus are what we call partnership libraries, which are our version of community managed libraries, and they don't have any open access at the moment. In the 10 libraries that run self-service, we have 188 staffed hours and 576 self-service hours. We're open from 7 in the morning until 10 at night at our to our largest four libraries and from eight in the morning till eight at night in the smaller libraries and the service is open seven days a week. The way that we make that staffing work is to have one batch of libraries open in self-service in the morning and another batch of libraries open in self-service in the afternoon and staff switch between the two sites across the middle portion of the day. All libraries are in self-service before nine o'clock and after five o'clock um, and um, all libraries have two days in the week where they are completely self-service. However, we do try to have a human intervention in each site every day, and we deploy some on-site security at the four largest libraries between 5 p.m. and 10 p.m., Monday to Friday, and each of the smaller libraries gets a visit from a roaming guard between 3 p.m. and 8 p.m. And those guards will help people um, with the basic technology, they'll respond to any incidents, sort out building issues, open the toilets um, and keep an, on top of the kind of basic housekeeping. So keeping the, the returns trolleys tidy. And the one million pounds that I talked about is after you take all of those added um, costs into account. So what have we learned? I've called it the good, the bad and the ugly because in truth, there's a little bit of, of all three. So to start with the positives, um, I am very much an advocate of self-service. It does work, uh, but there are some caveats. On the plus side, I would say that most people, for most of the time, do behave as they should and not as they might. We categorise all incidents from P1 to P4, P1 being those that... Re require um, attendance by emergency services or the police or that Hannah, I'm sorry, but you're cutting in and out a little bit. Um, but in over eight years of operating, I only had a handful of P1 incidents and certainly no enabled us to open up when otherwise we would have been closed. We were required to make without closing libraries. It's not uncommon now to say what to do about that, really. Um, I could try with Thanks, Hannah. I, th I think you started cutting in and out around just when you started talking about the P1 incidents. No, we've, we've lost you completely now.
Can you hear me at all now? Yeah, no, pitch perfect there. Thank you. No, you're back. Who, who, who knows what's going on? Right, let me try sharing again. <laughs> technology, eh? It's too much technology. It's once you start talking about it, it's the matrix kicking in, Hannah. Yeah, well, I'm coming on. I am on the bad and the ugly, so I suppose. Uh, um, right. Right. I think this is where we got to. Um, please shout if you can't hear me again. So, as I was saying, um, we haven't had that many P1 incidents in the last eight years that we've been um, we've been running the system. Uh, SSO does also enable us to open up libraries when otherwise we would have been closed. Um, and like I was saying, I'm not just talking in terms of making those savings um, and staying open, but also being open when we were never open before. It's not uncommon now to see parents sharing books with their children before they go to school, and that's something that we would never have been able to facilitate in the past. Introducing, um, and it was quite traumatic for all involved, um, and it did hit our visitor figures and our um, issues um, at the time, but we did build it back, um, and um, we were just about to surpass the pre-COVID, uh, pre, sorry, pre-Open Plus figures when the, when the pandemic started. However, Open Plus does make everything more challenging, and we now have to think um, quite carefully when we introduce new developments. We have to think with two things in mind. We have to think both in terms of making it work with staff in the building, but also making it work in a self-service context. So um, how to avoid the, uh, the bad and the ugly? So the first thing I would say is to set realistic expectations and don't overpromise. We were committed fairly early on to a 7am to 10pm opening uh, and a seven day a week offer. And whilst all of that is technically perfectly possible, it does leave us quite vulnerable at times. Uh, Self-service has got lots of elements. It's got uh, software, hardware, buildings, networks, um, you know, your LMS and all of the people factors. And um, so there's quite a lot um, within that chain that can go wrong. When we first rolled out the system, um, I had the expectation that we would have everything working more or less all of the time. But I soon realized that that probably wasn't totally realistic. And if I could go back in time, I would A, start with a smaller offer and B, um, have some troubleshooter posts that we could deploy to respond to sp specifically to issues if they arose. And we're now in the process of trying to get back to more of a 50-50 split between the staffed and the self-service hours so that we can add a bit more resilience into the offer. Because all of our libraries are self-service before 9 a.m. and the staff don't start on site until at least nine o'clock, there is no point in the entire week at any site where staff are on, in the building before the public. So we never have that moment where you can kind of get everything sorted and back in order before people start coming in. And I think that was also a mistake. So I'd like to have one day in the week where the staff were in the building first. Just a couple of other things that need a bit of thought when you're setting um, something like o Open Plus up around building management. It's now much harder for us to undertake routine building maintenance as we never have a closed day. And we've also had to think quite carefully about how to reconfigure the buildings so that emergency escape routes work in an unassisted fashion. So we've installed a lot of visual alarms, you know, the red flashing lights, um, and we have a lot of magnetic locks through um, escape routes so that doors will auto open automatically when the fire alarm goes off, uh, but won't leave uh, parts of the building unsecured when staff aren't on site. You also need to think about silly little things like windows and ventilation and how you're going to get them open and closed in self-service. Like most library services, we operate from quite a lot of older buildings. Um, and several of our sites have windows that can only be opened um, with long poles. All fine with staff on site, but much harder in self-service. We've also learned quite a few lessons over the years in terms of managing incidents. Nine times out of ten, if there's a problem, it's got nothing to do with people's behaviour and it's all about the automatic doors. So my advice would be very much to get to know the doors in each of your libraries how they work and crucially how you reset them and have a really good maintenance contract. In the early days, we had a lot of people who were pressing the green emergency break glass button, which you should see on the screen now, um, not because there was any kind of emergency, but just because they got confused about how they opened the doors uh, to get out. But as you'll probably know, when people do that, your doors won't lock again until that box has been reset. So now we have howlers over all of those emergency break glass boxes. But in the early days, there were quite a few frantic evenings where we couldn't lock the front doors at 10 o'clock at night and nobody could quite work out why.
On-call arrangements are also something else that I think we should have given greater thought to before we rolled it out across the borough. We have a fairly well-developed set of protocols for CCTV officers to follow in the event of an incident that takes them through any incident step by step, from the, most, uh, from the least serious to the most serious issue. But however minor an issue is, all issues have got to go somewhere and somebody's got to respond. And for the most part, for us, that's me, outside of um, office hours in the early mornings, evenings and at weekends. What's possible for you will depend upon the infrastructure of your own organisation. But this is another reason why I would advise in not overextending your hours at the start and building out gradually if you have capacity. I'm happy to share those uh, protocols with anybody um, uh, who, who would like to see them if they're helpful to you. And just finally on this slide, I think just think through um, in advance what your policy might be in the event of an issue which um, affects your opening hours. When the doors break or systems go down, which means that the card reader will no longer let people in, think about what it is that you're going to do. We have a policy of trying to reopen libraries within an hour, but we no longer open at, uh, libraries manually at 7 a.m. if we have a door issue. Um, uh, and we will temporarily amend the opening hours to open at nine o'clock. And that, I wish that was a conversation that we would have had um, with elected members and senior managers at the very start of the process. And finally, on to some customer assistance. So when we rolled out Open Plus to each site, we ran a, what we called here to help sessions at each site, which was a very small team of people, usually two to three people who were on site showing customers how to sign up for Open Plus, how the technology worked. And these teams stayed in, on site for anything between a month and three months, depending on what the need was. We now run those sessions periodically through the year to capture people who are new to the borough or new to the area or those who might be unfamiliar with self-service. We also have an information guard and a self-service notice board in every site with key safety information and step-by-step -step guides on how to, how to do stuff. So how to print, how to use the kiosks, how to use a PC, all of those kind of things. And we've recently transferred all of that information onto digital touch screens. Each library also has a set of Perspex holders outside the library front door with joining forms and opening hours to try and address that issue of uh, Um, you need a library card to come in the library, but how do you? Library has a, a post box inside the library into which customers can leave us feedback about things that haven't worked or things that need to work better, post um, joining forms or any paper reservation requests. Over the years, we've made a number of changes to the policies and procedures to try and make it as easy as possible for people to join the library and to use the library in self-service. So, for example, we no longer require adults to sign up separately for self-service in addition to their basic membership. Instead, all adult cards are automatically enabled for self-service. We explain to them what self-service is um, when they join and then they have a choice about whether they use it or not. We've also removed the requirement for a PIN to access the library. So originally, a customer would scan their card and put in their PIN into a keypad. Um, and we removed the PIN for a number of reasons. So first, a lot of people had difficulty in remembering their PIN and they tend to write the PIN on the back of their card, thereby really negating any real security from having it in the first place. Second, the keypads were um, the least reliable part of the hardware in the early version of Open Plus and they tended, the numbers tended to get stuck and then they would jam the door. And finally, with COVID, we wanted to reduce the number of touch points. And I have to say, it's been a really positive move and I would um, heartily recommend ditching the pin. When we started Open Plus, we required young people to be 15 and in year 11 at school before they could use self-service unaccompanied by an adult. As well as a parental signature, we also required them to get a stamp from their school to prove that they were in year 11. And this was a bit of a bureaucratic nightmare, to be honest, and it did um, uh, stop quite a lot of young people from coming to use the library. So we have since reduced that age to 14. And although we still require a parental signature for all young people under 18, we've removed the requirement for the school stamp. Again, I'd say this has been pretty positive and it hasn't resulted in any greater level of misbehaviour than we had before. Another big change that we've made is how we handle the transition between staffed and self-service hours. In the pilot, we always asked people at five o'clock to leave the library wait outside for five minutes or so, and then those who wanted to use the library in self-service would scan their card through the card reader and they would come back in. And it worked perfectly. 
When we rolled it out with the transition happening at 12.30 at lunchtime rather than at 5 p.m., I have to say it was an utter disaster. I can recall one particular day pouring with rain, standing over the other side of the road from probably our busiest library, watching this chaos unfold as the staff tried in vain to exit and re-enter 60 plus people, uh, most of whom didn't want to comply. So we stopped doing it. Um, and now we just make sure that people know we're moving into self-service and that they know what that means and that we don't have any un unaccompanied children in the library. And it's been absolutely fine. The final couple of things I just wanted to mention are two of the things that I get asked about most, and they are tailgating and toilets. Uh, to put it bluntly, you can't stop tailgating. You can ask people not to let others in. You can ask them not to tailgate. You can make it part of your sign-up procedure or your induction process, but it will still happen. Most tailgating is either inadvertent or it's a case of somebody not having a card and wanting to come in and use the library. It's not a question of somebody wanting to come in and make trouble. The thefts that I mentioned earlier um, are really the only negative outcome that we've had over those out years that have arisen from um, intentional tailgating. Toilets, on the other hand, are probably one of the most contentious issues in terms of self-service. We now have a policy of opening the toilets whenever there is a staff member or a security guard on site, even if that person is not there to run the library. So if somebody's there for a meeting or running an event or um, doing some stock work, for example, they will open the toilets. But if there isn't anybody who falls into that category, then we will keep them closed. Uh, I don't get as many complaints about it, but it is still um, something that is probably the least satisfactory. Um, and we haven't really come up with a particularly good way of, of, of managing that. And that's pretty much all I was going to say. Um, so uh, that's a whistle stop tour of open access, Barnet style. Thank you, Hannah. It's Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. It's a really interesting and practical insight into to open access and open plus. Um, I, I know I said I'd, I'd save all questions until the end, but that there is one that I think perhaps I should just ask now. It's, somebody asked them, what is a P1 instant? I'm curious. What, what oh, is sorry, a P1 that was instant? that was that was probably the bit that cut out. So we carry we categorize all all incidents in the library um, <clears throat> service from P1 to P4. And a P1 is priority one, basically. Um, and it just, we've categorized it as anything that requires attendance by emergency services, police, or requires us to evacuate the building. And I think we've probably had Thank half you a dozen. Much. Well, yeah. Well, thank you for clarifying that. I'm sorry to hear that, but it's it's helpful to know what a P1. There you go. That's great. Um, I know Jackie Taylor-Smith. I think she's been having a few technical problems. So I don't know if Jackie's been able I'm to here. rejoin us. I'm here. Oh, wonderful. Hello, Jackie. Good. I've, I had some awful technical problems, but no one wants to hear about that. I'm here now. <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, well, I'm very pleased, pleased that you're here. Are you able to share your screen if you've got a presentation? I so, am. Let's see if that works. Oh, there we go. Wonderful. Let, let me put it on to... Let me see if I can put it on to slideshow. Uh... Is it to the left like from the beginning? Yep. I can't see my notes though. So oh. I will wing my notes. Okay. Thank you. Right, everybody, thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be able to uh, speak with you this afternoon to talk to you about Kent Libraries, Library Extra and co-locations. First thing I'm going to do is a whistle stop tour uh, through Libraries Registration and Archives um, services in Kent. So Kent Libraries and Archives service integrated with Kent's registration service in 2012 and the integration of the two services delivered a significant saving for Kent. Delivery of birth and death registration moved out of traditional registry offices and into libraries, although our five registry offices uh, still continue to deliver marriage, civil partnership and citizenship ceremonies. And the Tombridge Wells Registry Office is also the certificate centre for Kent. 
The service also looks after Kent's archive and the repository is housed at the Kent History and Library Centre at Maidstone that is also the service headquarters. We have a library depot for county stock deliveries, um, the internal van delivery fleet, the county stock team, Kent's modern records team are all based at that Quarrywood uh, depot too. We still have a mo mobile library service uh, delivered from five vehicles with just over 270 stops, a home library service, a postal loan service, Ask a Kent librarian service, and a volunteer programme. Uh, we are also part of um, Arts, Count uh, Arts Council England uh, portfolio organisation, and we work with the British Library to deliver um, business and intellectual property uh, centre from some Kent libraries. We have a network of 99, and that is a 50 year historic legacy that we have those 99 uh, libraries. Uh, this has generated many conversations at Kent County Council over time, um, and the ability to significantly change the network of library buildings, the number, the locations, has so far eluded us, although uh, we have put proposals forward. So the library extra pilot, it's, we came at it from a slightly different direction um, than, than Barnet. Um, in 2017, uh, LRA went out to tender for a new RFID self-service contract. We had 108 kiosks across 30 plus of our libraries and a reserve fund of 1.5 million to spend. As a result of a very competitive um, procurement process and an exciting online e-auction, we were able to procure a new contract with new upgraded hardware uh, for far less than we had expected to pay. Um, and that gave us the opportunity to innovate further and the um, idea for Library Extra was a result of that. We were already aware of technology assisted open opening hours and how it was widely used across Scandinavian, Scandinavian libraries. Um, I started to do some analysis of what this technology could do, how it was used, what it would cost and so on. Um, and it was also the case that our RFID supplier, also Biblioteca, was leading the way in the UK with a system called Open Plus to deliver technology assisted opening hours. At the time, I contacted some UK library authorities um, that either had Open Plus technology or were going to implement it. And I specifically recall speaking with colleagues from Norfolk, Peterborough and Hertfordshire about their experiences and to ask for advice. So the next step was to write a business case uh, to take through the various required governance processes. And in agreement with my senior management colleagues, we agreed a clear concept that would form the basis of the business case. We agreed that this would be a pilot project with the aim to give L LRA the opportunity to assess the potential and impact of the technology, understand the challenges and test the appetite of customers to use it. We agreed that the technology assisted opening hours would be additional to the advertised staffed open opening hours. So hence the name Library Extra to make it absolutely clear that this was an innovation and added and not an efficiency saving. Uh, that the pilot would be funded from the procurement underspend and to avoid another procurement process to make it a variation of the existing contract with Biblioteca. And finally, uh, that three locations could be chosen because that's what we could afford and that those three locations would reflect the different tiers of library and the different and different types of communities. We got the go ahead. The project was initiated and working alongside the installation project were all of the other considerations, security, health and safety, terms and conditions of membership, membership induction, equality, insurance, and so on. 
Community engagement was focused on existing customers and residents at the three locations. We advertised and promoted drop-in sessions to promote Library Extra and to allow people to raise any concerns and ask questions of the project team. We also did some promotion at Paddockwood uh, Station, a press release, local radio and online advertising. The services available during Library Extra Hours are issue and dis discharge, renewals, payment of fees and charges, use of public PCs and Wi-Fi, and use of the library for generally browsing, study, book groups, and community meetings. And um, there are quite a few uh, groups, for example, that meet at Higham Library in the evenings using Library Extra. The hours are available from 7 a.m. through to 9 p.m., seven days a week. And so, for example, at Deal Library, already opened and staffed for seven days uh, a week, library extra hours are limited to early morning and late evenings. And at Higham, that is only open for half days, the library extra hours are more extensive. So after about nine months, you know, of the after the launch of Library Extra, we did begin to carry out an evaluation, and that included a customer and staff survey, um, use and visitor data, etc. Uh, for me, uh, from the project management perspective, um, the the highlights that stand out are um, because the door entry and alarm issues were early uh, teething problems, I recommend that a more robust testing before the service is launched, um, you know, is undertaken. Um, the issue with the automatic doors and the intruder alarm, uh, intruder alarm was caused by retrofitting an automated door onto an existing non-automated door. So I recommend that sites with fully functioning automatic automated doors are chosen for technology assisted opening hours in the first instance and wherever possible. Um, another learning, um, and this was contrary to gloomy um, predictions, the additional utility costs generated by additional opening hours um, has been minimal and no issues raised by corporate landlord. Um, so that was that was a learning for me. Um, the processes that we put in place to mitigate against any security and health and safety issues have proved uh, adequate. Um, there have been no significant health and safety or security incidents reported, um, either formally or informally. And the staff and customer surveys that we carried out initially and, and uh, periodically um, support this. Um, but of course, we, we do only have those three. Um, the ability to use services during early mornings and later in the evening has proved popular with some customer, but Library Extra has been used most where it has been available when the library would otherwise be closed during mm -hmm. usual daytime uh, hours. So, co-location. Um, and LRA's approach. Uh, going back a little bit, but the start of this journey was uh, in the mid 2000s when a program called Gateway was developed mm -hmm. between Kent County Council and some of the 12 district councils to co-locate district uh, services, for example, housing benefits and council tax payments with some of KCC's and third sector um, services under the umbrella of Gateway. Libraries were identified as being a key potential partner because of the number of buildings we occupy. And most, but not all of the gateways included a public library. And we have examples at Margate, Ashford, Isle of Sheppey, Swanley, Sevenoaks and Tenterton. At the time, LRA developed a set of principles to try to ensure that its services would retain enough space to adequate, adequately deliver its core services and crucially to be able to continue to afford to deliver them whilst maximising you know, uh, opportunity for improved access to the building. Um, so the principles broadly are um, co-location cannot cost LRA more to deliver 
for example, by extending staff opening hours um, to match building opening hours if they are more than our existing opening hours. Uh, that there is a minimum space specification for each of the five library tiers, that that is achieved. Willingness to share back office, uh, to create flexible spaces uh, for shared delivery wherever possible, and that access to stock and self-service when the building is open outside of library staffed hours um, is achieved and those customers can self-serve. Um, the Built the slide at the top just shows um, the Amelia, which is a very new co-located building, and that houses the Tunbridge Wells Town Centre Library, the museum run by Tunbridge Wells Borough Council, and the art gallery uh, run by um, uh, Tunbridge Wells Borough Council, and the library, of course, delivered by uh, KCC. And underneath shows um, another uh, fairly new co-located building, the Southborough Hub. Um, and that is a co-location of the library, the town council offices and a theatre. And both of these examples um, allow the library to be accessed when the building is open out of library hours. So towards autumn 2025, um, KCC is currently running a Kent Communities programme that is proposing changes to the delivery of community services from some buildings. And the services included in this programme are children's centres, adult day services, adult education, public health services and gateways. Um, some of the buildings uh, across Kent are proposed to be closed and co-location with libraries is a major part of some of the proposals. Currently, 14 libraries across Kent have been proposed to co-locate with some or all of the services being looked at. Um, and we are currently in the thick of negotiations about space planning and opening hours and are, you know, having some hard talk, if you like, about applying the principles that I just mentioned. Um, it is proposed that a library network review will take place in 2025 and uh, is likely to propose some library closures. So part of what I'm currently working on is a paper to consider if and how Library Extra technology um, assisted opening hours could provide additional opening hours at remaining libraries to help to mitigate against future library closures. So we're already beginning to uh, look at that. And I think that, um, is it really? That's uh, in a nutshell, that is our library extra and co-location um, work. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie. I'm, I'm really pleased you were able to uh, join us today and get the technology working because that was an extremely interesting insight to what's going on in Kent. So thank you for that. You're um, what I'd like to do now is kind of mo mo move us on to the uh, a more, more of a panel session. And we're, we're going to be joined, um, Jackie and Hannah are going to be joined by two, two people who've got a lot of experience around Open Plus. Um, I'll just, just give a brief introduction and I'll, uh, we'll open up to more questions. Um, so we've got Kim Aitken. Um, Deputy Head Service of Northern Ireland, uh, who was part of an operational group who was tasked with investigating the potential for out-of-hours libraries in Northern Ireland in 2017. The group led on discussions with partners, stakeholders and staff in order to bring this to fruition. And subsequently, one of the libraries she was responsible for became the first pilot out of hours library in Northern Ireland. Many of the process resources and guidance that were formulated for that library are still being used across all other locations. So really great experience there. And we're also going to be joined by Kate Lister, who is the resource manager for Leicestershire Libraries. Um, Leicestershire have 51 static libraries in the network, 35 are community managers and 16 are county council managed. In 2019, following years pilot assistant library, 14 of the council run libraries implemented Open Plus Access, which is known in Leicestershire as smart libraries, as part of efficiency savings. 
Although core staff hours were reduced, the core, the Open Plus technology provided Leicestershire with the opportunity to extend library access to customers from 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday to Friday and 8 a.m. 6 p.m. on a Saturday. So welcome both Kim and Kate. I wondered maybe just to kick us off in, in, in this section of the webinar, whether you might just both just give us a short kind of introduction about how, how you moved into the Open Plus kind of arena or started implementing that technology and perhaps any key lessons you've learned. I don't know, Kim, do you, do you want to kick us off with that, please? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. And apologies, my camera is not working, so technology is certainly not on our side today. Um, I'll give you just a wee bit of background about where we are with the service, which we call Out of Ours. Um, as, I, as you said in the, the introduction, I was part of a group that visited lots of other locations in 2017 to look at what this, this system could do for us in Northern Ireland. And we were able to, following that, with um, some funding from one of our other departments called DERA, so that's the Department of Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, so DERA, um, through funding with those, was able, were able to, to bring six libraries um, to fruition with out of ours. Those six libraries, obviously because of where the funding um, came from in Northern Ireland, were small rural libraries, part-time libraries um, in those uh, six locations. Um, and those worked very, very well for us and very successfully and opened in, in the 2017-18 year. Um, following that, in 2022, we tested another pilot um, in uh, at Oma Library, a much larger library, which was a full-time library open Monday to, to Saturday. Um, and in that instance, um, Oma still has a, a large rural hinterland. And for the department that funded us, it was really important um, that they were looking at, at that stage rural connectivity, which was very poor in some of those outlying areas. And that also people living in those rural um, areas would be able to access other services and that they were able to do um, through customers using um, or out of ours. So we currently have seven locations um, which are operational as out of ours. And they are either um, open on days when those small part-time libraries would have been closed um, or they're open to extend ours. So if a library was maybe open from 10 to 6, we've been able to extend beyond that from 6 to 10 um, and also open um, on a Sunday and they are relatively well used given that for many of those the, the actual catchment area um, for those small rural libraries is quite small so that's that's sort of where we are at the minute. You asked about um, what learning I think I would reiterate probably what Hannah said at the start is to start small um, and to kind of think through a lot of the, the things that Hannah had in, in her presentation. Um, sometimes you go into it with the best will in the world and things kind of appear on your doorstep that you hadn't thought of before. But this type of presentation gives a really good opportunity to see where those teething problems um, potentially lie. So I think slowly, slowly is probably our best learning on that. Thank you, Kim. That, that's really interesting. I like the approach. Slowly, slowly. Um, Kate, in, in terms of Leicestershire, what, what's your experience been there in, in implementing Open Plus? Well, lots of similarities from all three that I've heard this, this afternoon. Um, I, I totally agree. You cannot underestimate how much time and engagement the process takes. And for us, we did our implementation of the Open Plus technology alongside a staffing restructure because it was based on efficiency savings. So we were restructuring the hours of our library assistants at the same time as implementing the technology, amending our 14 buildings, the doors, um, the CCTV, the layouts. Um, and that was a huge amount of work with a very small team to try and implement so I think I would absolutely agree that you, if you have the opportunity to start small and then roll out bigger we didn't have that opportunity we had a target date for when efficiency savings needed to be made and even then I think we still had over an 18 month lead in time by the time we'd done a pilot we'd done the consultation with the communities we'd engaged with the stakeholders we um as I say, adapted our buildings in preparation. We had a really robust and thorough induction process for all our communities, and that took time for people to involve with. But then we also had alongside 
the amendments to the staffing contract. So it was a huge undertaking. So the, the longer you can give yourselves to do that, the better. And I, I've, I've, I've got to ask, because you're obviously dealing with that in, in the different circumstances to a lot of the speakers we've had this afternoon. It sounds like a, a very pressured and, and stressful, stressful time for you. How, how do you manage that process with the staff? Because obviously this is a, a challenge to their, their working. Yeah. It was a challenge, but I guess the whole thing is you have to keep them engaged, you have to keep them part of the process, you have to keep the communication, you can't underestimate how long the communication and the support that they need to do that. But it was a whole operation and resources approach, a whole structure approach to the, the migration. It was basically a down tools for everything else. This was the priority for the service. We've got to get this to happen. And so we had different leads on different elements of the whole migration to SMART, um, but it wouldn't have worked unless we had everybody involved with the process. Thank you. And just out of interest, Kate, I mean, how, how did the public respond to it, given that it was in that atmosphere of change? What was the reaction like? I think for Leicestershire, we went, we had been, well, like a lot of authorities, we'd been through a lot of change over the years anyway. We'd had previously 35 of our libraries move to community managed libraries. And I think there was fear amongst the public that, well, what's going to happen next to our service? So I, I, I do feel very strongly that the public got behind the transition to smart because I think it was a bit of a use us or lose us their feeling very much was we will support this because we want it to work and we want to keep our local libraries. So prior to transitioning all our libraries to SMART, we did an eight week induction program in each of our libraries, which were group inductions delivered by all different members of staff. Um, and throughout the, that induction process, we would have 20 people sign up for a a group session and induct themselves to become a smart member because if a customer hasn't done the induction they cannot be a smart they can't use libraries in smart access time so we did this really thorough induction process prior to transitioning to smart and every session was kind of booked up by customers because you could tell they really wanted to get on board and support it because they were concerned about mm. well, what is going to happen to our library if we don't yeah thank you Oh, that's that's really interesting to hear. Um, Kim, can I can I put the same question to you? I'm just kind of curious. What, what was the reaction of staff and, and public alike in in Northern Ireland to the introduction of the technology? Um, I think I suppose that all the the focus spoke today come from it with a, a slightly different angle. Whether it was to make savings or you know review structures and and so on. I think say we came we came to it because we had the the money from the the, the department to to enable people living in rural areas to have greater access to services. Um, I think we were also very clear um, because we had spoken to colleagues from the south of Ireland that this was a, a complementary service for us, a different type of service. So it, for us it wasn't about um, replacing staff, it was to um, um, give additional access for people in those um, catchment areas where the libraries were based. So I suppose our staff maybe weren't as nervous or or unsure, um, although we did have to do quite a lot of, of talking to them to, to kind of bring them round to that way because initially they did see it as a bit of a threat because of experiences elsewhere. Um, I have to say the, the folk who came on board first in, in our first library then became our greatest advocates. And I think I would reiterate what, what Kate and other folk have said that really it's about buying in um, buying in the staff that you've got there on the ground to then sell it to customers, but also sell it to whether it's local councillors or other stakeholders, um, community groups and so on in, in the location. So that certainly would have been another um, really good sound learning point for us was to really bring the staff in those locations with us and then use their buying power locally to, to kind of bring on other people in the locations. That's brilliant. I, li I like that. In, in terms of selling the technology to the customers, that, that's a really good approach. I'm going to jump around a little bit and try and address some of the questions that have popped up in the chat. Um, but just, just a couple of very quick procedural things. Um, Hannah, um, we've, we've had a lot of uh, requests to circulate what I'm going to call the Barnet Protocols. Um, you, you're, you're kind Makes of... Uh, sound you're, very you're grand, doesn't it? I know, it sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, if, if, if you're happy, yeah, yeah, I think... Totally. I, I think that might be something Helen can circulate after 
after the session. And um, Jackie, we also had questions around the co. I think it was the co-location principles, and as to whether those could be circulated as well. If you're happy to to put those out, absolutely, I, lost... yeah, absolutely. Oh, that 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 that's wonderful. Thank you. Um, just just jumping back to Hannah, one one of the questions that popped up was around what consultation or public engagement you took before I installing um, self access. I don't know if you'd like to make any comments on that. Yeah, so because it was part of a broader transformation project, because so our situation was much like Kate's, really. It was it was part of a big raft of changes that were happening um, at that time to make those savings. So obviously all of those went through numerous versions of um, of consultation because it's quite an iterative process, isn't it, de designing those kind of changes. So um, we we had general consultation about all of the changes, Open Plus included, but we also did a separate kind of survey of the early adopters in the pilot study. And that was quite instrumental in switching, for example, from the um, uh, recorded CCTV to the live monitored CCTV. That was one of the, the, um, the key elements that, that convinced elected members that they wanted to go for the live monitored CCTV and, and not just the recording. So um, we, we had quite a lot of consultation. I think there were about three different sets of consultation about Open Plus or, or with Open Plus being part of it. We've also done some consultation subsequent to that. So um, just uh, in 2019-20, we had the activist group. Um, some of you, I'm sure, will be aware of um, uh, where of that uh, uh, consultancy kind of company uh, undertook so a review of all of the changes that we'd made in, in 2017, including introducing self-service. And they went back and, and um, interviewed a lot of people uh, a number of whom said I was really against this to start with, but actually it's really great because I can come to the library whenever I want now. Um, so I think it, that did show a certain shift in some people's uh, opinions and experience as they got used to it. Thank you. I thank you for that. Um, Jackie, I'm, I'm, uh, we've had, just had more questions popping up in the chat, which is great. Please do keep them coming. Um, I One question from Kelly in, in London in Sutton was around, so, sorry, Alan Hood. I thought that was that was a good point. Kelly was saying about how the, the open access um, enables staff who don't want to work on social hours. It enables the libraries to be open for longer, which is great. Alan was asking, and I wondered if Jackie, you might be able to answer this. Do the extra opening hours create much extra work for library staff? Uh, I think particularly in Kent, because you did this as an, in addition to your, your current opening hours. So, yeah, are you finding it's creating additional work? I do think in the very beginning, um, at one of our libraries that normally is single staffed um, in staffed hours, that until um, the process, until the member of staff got used to the process, of switching over from um, open access to staff, staffed hours. I think it took her a little bit of time and I do recall a little bit of grumbling around that, um, but that has all settled down and I would say any additional um, work is absolutely at a minimum now. I think everybody's got so used to the technology and you know there, there's a, a, a 15 minute changeover period, so it isn't an issue. It's just Can a question I of kind of bedding it in. Sorry, who was coming in there? Okay, I was going to just add a little bit to that from kind of the Leicestershire element, because we have two tiers of libraries. We have a sort of a larger library network and then the small, what we call shopping centres. They have had their staffed hours quite dramatically reduced. And I would suggest if people are looking at their patterns of opening staffed hours compared to open plus access, try not to leave too much of a gap between when you're staffed and when you're open, because we can have some libraries that close at one, one staffed, on a Tuesday and not reopen again till 10 on a month Thursday morning. So we're expecting them to still do the same duties that they would have normally done within those hours, but also to pick up on the shelving and so on that had happened within that time in the banking. So if you're looking at your pattern of your staffed and um, self-access hours, just be quite clear about what that could, and what, what duties it could it, uh, create. Can I just add something to that as well? Because um, early on, we had one library which had its two self-service days back to back. And um, that wasn't a good idea either. So we shifted it so that we had a staff day in between because just to, just to basically keep on top of the basic housekeeping.
um, and just your returns trolleys and your, and your returns. And so you, you have to have enough staff intervention at, at enough intervals in, in order to keep it ticking over. Sorry, lost you there a little bit, Hannah. I don't know if that was just me. I, I, I seem to have a little bit of a lag on the line here. I think I've been online for too long today. It's uh, <laughs> computers rebelling. Um, I, I was just going to pop back to, to Kate in Leicestershire. I was just kind of curious what you were saying about the, the closing periods there. I mean, how are you operating that in Leicestershire? Sorry, I didn't mean it as closed. I meant it as open plus. So, for example, we would be staffed between 10 and 1, and then at one o'clock we would might move from staffed to open plus hours until seven so we wouldn't actually be closed we start it's open plus hours and then the next day we would reopen as open plus for maybe a full day and then we would move back right. to staffed hours oh, i'm with you okay so it's switching between day to day yeah. so it's you haven't really got a transition period to manage in quite the same way well we, we would have we have a 10 minute transition period where right. we have to clear all the customers out and uh, then they have to come back in again if they as a smart access if they've got it enabled on their card okay thank you just just jumping across the uh, the, the water to northern ireland kim um you you might be able best place to answer this but other on the panel maybe as well um does anyone have a completely staffless warehouse type offer i don't know if that's something that's you've considered in northern ireland no, it's certainly not something that that we have looked at or or have or have looked at. I have to say, not sure if it it happens elsewhere. I don't know if anyone else is operating anything like that or has considered that. Not presently. Maybe. No, no, I, 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 I don't think, think think we're quite quite there yet, are we? I think so it I'm would just, fall just... apart fairly quickly. Um... Yeah, and I, I, it, it is one of the things that comes up, and one of the things we've had to kind of slightly argue um, over the years, um, especially with elected members who see it as a as an opportunity to to cut the staff even more. And so mm. I'm really clear about it that Open Plus works, but it only works because it's underpinned by a core of paid. Um, professional with a small p staff and actually if you cut that staff the self-service hours fall apart as well because there's an awful lot of work that goes on in the background and we try to keep it so that it doesn't look like we're frantically kind of you know um, uh, paddling uh, underneath but there's a lot of work that goes in the background to make it look like it's effortless. Excellent point thank you Hannah I, I, I do like that. There was another question around what the footfall is like in terms of um, uh, I don't know, what we got. has footfall decreased in libraries during opening hours, e.g. those branches staffed half days? That's that's an interesting question. So are, are you finding a change in that? I mean, Hannah, you, you might be best placed because you've been doing it a little while start on that one. So we we did when we first when we first made the change. Um, it, there was quite a, a quite a dramatic difference and, and quite a drop in the footfall. But over time, um, like I say, it took us three years to get back to the same footfall that we'd had before we'd introduced it. And we, we were just uh, increasing the footfall after, um, as the pandemic started. It's quite site by site specific. So there are sites where the footfall in self-service is every bit as high as it is in, in staffed hours. And there are some libraries where they're much quieter in self-service than they are in, in staffed hours. And it's a little bit to do with um, where they're located as much as anything else. Um, but it takes time, I think, for people to get used to it and to get mm. used to the change, particularly in a, in a big library where people have just been used to walking in all the time um, and, it, and it hasn't mattered. They haven't needed to know what the opening hours. That was a transition that was quite difficult for people. I think in the smaller libraries, ironically, that was much easier because they'd always had a closed day. So in a way, they got more access to their local library than they'd had previously. In the bigger libraries, you didn't need to know what the opening hours were because it was always open. And then suddenly you oh. did need to know when it was self-service and when it wasn't. Thank you, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, Jackie, what, what's your experience been around the, the, the footfall question? Uh, I would say in the two smaller libraries at Paddockwood and Higham, it's a similar um, experience to Hannah. It was a bit of a slow build and then um, COVID disrupted everything um, and then we're gradually building again and the uh, those two libraries that I just mentioned Paddockwood and Higham are only part-time staffed hours and um, those hours during uh, the 
usual opening hours that is library extra of proving very very popular and i say there's a bit of a balance you know it, uh, football was increased in both um, and we can are uh, have now surpassed visitor figures pre-covid so people are wanting to come together a deal is a different kettle of fish it uh, is a library that's open seven days a week um and so library extra is only used outside of those um, usual staffed opening hours. Um, but I would say that the people that use early in the morning and later in the evening are new, completely different set of people that probably wouldn't be coming during uh, during the usual office hour staff staffed hours. And, and, and what, what are those new people coming into the library to do? Is it to borrow books or is it to study? What's what, what's their kind of reason there, for visiting? There is some borrowing, but it's mainly to use, uh, take, take um, use the space for study, um, to use the Wi-Fi, in some cases to use the public access PCs. It's mainly that just somewhere to go quiet, um, you know, we want to get on with this and we need to do this after work or before right. work. I think some people, particularly at Paddockwood, do grab a, a book or, or borrow something before they jump on the train because it's a, a commuter route and it, it's right opposite the library. So it does vary. Um, yeah, so it's quite interesting. But at Higham Library, uh, we have a, quite a few community groups, the local history group, um, the bridge club and, and several others that come in and use uh, the library in the evening for community, you know, use it as a community space. Thank you. That, that's really interesting to see how it's all kind of you know, panning out during the course of the day. Um, just had a, a, a great question slash comment from Kelly um, in Sutton. Uh, it's been interesting, but not unexpected, perhaps, how upset customers become when they arrive on a self-service self-access session and are able to access the library um I'm really interested how other authorities have overcome these obstacles and i'm thinking kate is that something you might be able to speak to <laughs> yeah i can so um we have i'm sure like most authorities now we have an online joiner form so if you aren't a member of the library you can go onto our website and you can join the library and get a, a library card and pin number and we've also created um, an online smart library induction form. So once you've got your library card number, if you aren't a library member already, you can use both those numbers to do the online induction form, which then talks back to our library management system once it's been completed, updates the record in the library management system, which will send a case that they are a smart library user. And there you are, you're, you've got your card and your access provided. So in theory, you could stand outside a library, go on our website, do both the online joiner and the smart induction, and then you've got your access enabled straight away to get into the building. Thank you. So there is a way around it, but yeah, I'm sure you do get people popping up at your door unexpectedly. Kim, can, can, I, can I put a question to you around closing time? Um, just around how you manage it at the end of the day with in terms of customers leaving the building, checking out the premises, the practicalities of setting alarms. How, how does that work in Northern Ireland? Um, ours may be a slightly different to the others. So I, I mentioned Deira, um, who funds the, the capital cost for our different locations. Where, and libraries and I then look after things like the ICT costs, the utility costs, and for us, the additional, uh, another additional cost is the cost of security. So at the end, I suppose, because ours are rural um, libraries that we're talking about that are quite a distance from larger towns, um, maybe poor lighting and so on around that, we have um, engaged with a security service who at the end of a night will then pay a visit to the library to ensure, for example, there, there's no one ill and has taken ill and the library uh, to check that the doors have um, closed and the building is secure for the evening. So we would have that in place for, for all of the libraries that we currently have operational. Um, and yes, it is an additional charge, but for us, it gives us that peace of mind, I suppose, that everything is secure um, and locked uh, in those locations. Mm. It's just that peace of mind, isn't it? But it's, it's how you put those those procedures in place. Um, yes. I think we've got time just for one last question. I, I might just hop back to Jackie 
if if that's okay just around it follows really on from what you were discussing around groups using the libraries and how how do you manage those groups um in a small library when you've got customers browsing and you've got groups activities running as well does it need over any overseeing or is it a kind of we, self -managing we, don't, activity? we don't manage them at all they manage themselves we're not there and uh you know the the, the groups successfully use um, and I'm sure other people go in and maybe use a PC or um, are browsing, um, but it all seems to work out. I haven't certainly, and I know Hyam, I know the Hyam community quite well because I used to, years ago, used to work at the, the library and I have got friends that live there. Um, and they are so pleased with the service and somehow it works out. So I couldn't tell you how they're managing it, just that they are. It, it is fascinating, isn't it? Kim, did you want to jump in on that? Sorry, no, I pressed I pressed something inadvertently. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> okay. So it, 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 it is fascinating how left to their own devices, a lot of the public just seem to kind of you know, crack on and they, they, they welcome that space as their own space, really. Um, I, I'm conscious of time. We've got a few minutes left. So I just wanted to invite, invite our, our four speakers really to make any um, final comments or reflections on, on what we've all heard today. Uh, I, I don't know. Would, would Hannah, would you would you like to start off? You were the first speaker. Would you like to say anything to kind of a, wrap up? Um, I would say uh, it's certainly worth doing. Um, uh, I don't think we've regretted introducing Open Plus. It certainly adds to the offer. There's some things that I would do differently if I had my time again, or if we'd had um, to save less money, um, or we had kind of a bit more free reign over, over, over what we'd done. But it certainly is, um, I think, broadly beneficial um, in keeping the, the library offer relevant to as many people as possible and in as many places as possible. Thank you, Hannah. Kate, can I can I ask you for any thoughts? Um, I think probably reiterate something Hannah said right at the start about doors. Just make sure. <laughs> I think doors are the <laughs> downfall for this whole system. So I would just say, if you are thinking of installing the technology, make sure you've got robust doors with a good plan behind them, because uh, that's certainly been a big challenge for us <laughs> the whole time. So it's always something practical, isn't it? I remember when I started in this job, I was always told that a block toilet would end the day, but actually doors, yeah, if you're doing Open Plus, that's the thing that's going to sink you. Absolutely, I can second Kim. that. Kim, sorry, Jackie, go on. You, you, I'll, 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 I'll bring you in, Jackie. Give, give, give us your, your final kind of takeaway. It, it was, yeah, just to say, absolutely doors. Doors and intruder alarms and the links between the two were particular difficulties uh, in Kent with a couple of our libraries. And, and Kim, I will I, force I that as well, sir. I think I will, after the second, third and fourth doors are the, the big, the, the doors kind of make or, or break. And we've had quite a number of, of issues with doors. Um, I think I'd just say, and um, certainly to, to jump on the back of Hannah, the, the benefits, the, the people that we've talked to who's library, whether it's a mummy with the autistic child or whether it's the group of student nurses who come in to study, um, for those people, the service is is um, so impactful and so beneficial that it's absolutely worthwhile to do. It, there is an expense to it, obviously, as with all things. And I think as we certainly in Northern Ireland review the service, we, there is a need to look at other ways beyond um, or out of hours to to make libraries more accessible out of normal normal opening hours or normal staffed hours. So that that's really the process that we're engaged in at the minute. So, yeah. Yeah, looking forward and moving on, I think. Thank you, Kim, and, and thank you to, to all our speakers who've contributed today and, and everyone who's asked questions. And I'm sorry if I've oversee, overlooked uh, some of the comments or questions you put in the chat because there has been an awful lot coming in. Um, I, I found that very valuable and I hope you've all found that a useful uh, session too. Uh, I think it's just so interesting how, like you say, Kim, it can make things accessible and uh, reachable to a whole people in our community who might not otherwise be able to access their library. But Hannah, I think you nailed it as well in that we need to keep that professionalism in there to, to underpin it. Uh, the, the, the open warehouse um, certainly isn't something that we'd be considering at the moment. So thank you all. I hope you all have a, a, a great afternoon and um, I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks then.